Welcome everybody. This way you're joining us. Um, if we can direct your attention to the chat box. Uh, I can see the numbers are increasing. So we've 67 people joined us now. So for those of you that have joined, you're very welcome. Um, if we could ask you to take a look in the chat box and draw your attention to menti.com. And menti.com is to help us get an idea of where you're all from uh, so that we can say hello to everyone. So if you don't, if you have a smartphone or if you have um, another screen, you can use and uh, put in the code 46738023. And uh, just tell us where you're from, that would be great. So just while everyone else is joining us. And as I say, you're very, very welcome. This is the first of our series of events for International Dark Sky Week. I'm gonna reshare it in the chat box because um, I believe it's not there yet, just one second. Go. So folks, just to remind you, yes, menti.com, menti pop the code in 46738023. And we'll have a look at how the results are coming in because I can change my screen now. So. Right, we've got the United Kingdom joining us. We've got Westport, we've got Mayo, we've got Dublin, you're very welcome. So just while um, we're all gathering together, um, a little bit of housekeeping for the evening. Um, we are recording this uh, webinar. Um, may we ask you to put your comments and uh, your messages in the chat box and to put your questions into the questions and answers box. Um, and we can upvote the questions. So during the course of the evening, we can um, see what are the most popular questions and take a look at them first um, and see which ones you want to hear. So um, my name is Georgia Macmillan. Um, I'm the Mayo Dark Skies Park Development Officer. Um, I'm also a member of the Friends of Mayo Dark Skies. I'm delighted to welcome you, as I say, to International Dark Sky Week. And uh, we have a full week for you. Um, so D International Dark Sky Week uh, was set up by a young lady, um, a high school student back in 2003, um, and the event is now endorsed by the International Dark Sky Association. <clears throat> this is the fifth year that uh, Mayo has hosted International Dark Sky Week, <clears throat> and normally we plan a, a physical roadshow uh, to take you from one community to another within County Mayo and showcase our dark skies. Obviously this year is uh, unusual and we have a virtual roadshow for you. Um, so we'd like to welcome new communities this week. We have, last year we were featuring new communities on the north coast of Mayo. Um, this year we've moved to the islands. So we'll be introducing uh, three of the Mayo islands to the dark sky community. Uh, and that's along with the regular hosts of Newport, Mulrani and Ballycroy. And just before I hand over to our host for the evening, um, I'm going to just share our screen and see how we got on with the Menti and see where everyone's from. And we might share it again later in the evening if we haven't got to, oh, we've got lots of places coming in. So uh, very welcome. I see yeah. New York is there. I see Castle Bar, Ross Carman, uh, Croke Patrick. So if somebody's at the top of Croke Patrick, we'll give you a wave. Uh, we have USA, we have Germany, Belgium, um, Mulrani, of course. Um, so you're all very welcome. We'll, we'll keep that open for a while and we can come back to it later on in the evening. But um, for now, um, we need to move on to our first stop on the roadshow and no better place than Newport, the gateway to the Mayo Dark Sky Park and home of the Dark Sky Festival and which seems only a few weeks ago since we were last presenting the Dark Sky Festival to you. Um, but here we are, and there's no one better to uh, take the, the reins for the hosting of Newport than our own festival director, Fiona Hopkins. And with that, Fiona, I'll hand over to you and thank you very much. 
Thank you, George. I hope you can all hear me and uh, welcome to Mayo, those of you who are, are not from here. And uh, for those of you who are, lucky you. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen now. And I hope you can all see that. As I say, you're all very, very welcome to Mayo. I'm actually going to start the evening with a, a short video, uh, partly to uh, get you in the mood and hopefully make you feel like you're here with us in Newport or in Mayo and uh, to allow any latecomers time to get settled in and uh, check their viewing options and things like that. Uh, so without further ado, Here's a short video about Newport. I hope you're all feeling nice and relaxed looking at that beautiful scene. And I will join you again in about one minute. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. It was just to set the scene and welcome you to Newport, your host uh, community for this evening's talk. Uh, as I said, you're welcome here. And there you are in Mayo and more particularly in the Clue Bay and Bella Craher Bay area of Mayo, where over the next week, six communities will welcome you to their communities uh, with a variety of talks to celebrate International Dark Sky Week, starting tonight in Newport. Tomorrow, you'll be joining Brendan and uh, PJ in Clare Island, on north to Ackle Island, Ballycroy, Mulrani, and finishing up in beautiful Inish Turk next Sunday uh, for the final talk of Mayo's participation in International Dark Sky Week. And it's my job to welcome you to Newport and uh, to be honest, I could talk for the next hour about Newport, but I suspect you're more interested in exploring Mars than exploring Mayo. So I will keep it brief, uh, but I do love to talk about my adopted home where I've lived here for 21 years. And uh, so what I will do is just talk a little bit about what I think is, is one of the most, um, the most striking aspects of Newport, and that is its setting. You can see there Newport in the foreground and the panorama of Clue Bay out in the background, dominated by Clare Island, who will be your host tomorrow evening, by the way. And there it is, the largest island in Clue Bay there in the background. So look, Newport is, is on Clue Bay, on the Wild Atlantic Way, on the Great Western Greenway. Um, it is the gateway to Mayo Dark Sky Park and Wild Nathan. And also for those hikers and trekkers among you, it is on the Bangor Trail and the Western Way. So it really is smack dab in the middle of, of uh, everything that's happening in Mayo. It, and a pretty scene, the waterside, its waterside location is just incomparable. As you can see, if you're lucky enough to take a boat out into Clue Bay, that's the site that will greet you as you're leaving Newport heading out on the boat towards Clare Island there in the background. 
And this is the site that will greet you on your return to the town of Newport. So really it's, it's the perfect base for all kinds of activities. And of course the countryside surrounding it is unparalleled. There we have the beautiful Burishul Bridge there at sunset. And up north then in Wild Nathan and Mayo Dark Sky Park, you can see a landscape that's totally unspoilt and almost untouched by humans, but certainly not untouched uh, by the elements and by nature, as you can see there. So it's the perfect base for many activities on the water, canoeing, stand-up paddling, and all kinds of fun on the water, but also on land. Of course, just outside Newport there is Burishill Bridge and Red Bridge, part of the Great Western Greenway. Or for the more adventurous among you, uh, trekkers and hikers love to explore Wild Nathan, which really is a wilderness, and enjoy the great outdoors there with some shelter. So an amazing setting uh, and a beautiful location. But one of the most striking things I think about Newport and that maybe sets it apart from a lot of other rural towns is its built heritage. And I want to focus on just a couple of those now. And that is the railway viaduct itself from the 19th century and St. Patrick's Church from the early 20th century. Newport Viaduct really dominates the town as you can see there, a beautiful seven arch bridge uh, made of sandstone and limestone. And uh, you've seen many, many photos of it, I'm sure. And uh, it really does uh, make a striking um, sight uh, as you approach the town from both Castlebar and from Westport. It was actually built in uh, 1892 and I have some lovely old photos there of the construction in progress, which I thought I'd share with you. Uh, I think a thousand men were actually employed uh, to construct the railway line that was to extend the railway from Westport all the way out to Ackle. So the Dublin to Westport line was extended in 1892 uh, out to Ackle. There's the construction work going on and we even had our own beautiful uh, railway station there in the foreground. And if you look here where I'm pointing there with my uh, mouse is the viaduct or the surface of the viaduct. In the background, you'll see a tunnel there and there's a closer up, close up look of the tunnel. And you can see the railway line itself is very much a working railway line there with the signal and everything, but beautiful tunnel in the background. And you can see that in more detail. They're almost uh, completed uh, construction there in 1892 and then the finished one on the right hand side. So a thing of great beauty, I think, and uh, I hope you agree. I love to look at the men working there and they're all wearing their suits. It's, uh, it's a lovely sight. What you're seeing there is actually the, the only known photo that I've been able to come across of an actual steam train on the viaduct. And this was in the 1930s. So it's a, it's a, a wonderful photograph. And you'll notice there that the Corpus Christi procession is taking place in the town itself going over the road bridge. And although the trains don't run today, certainly the Corpus Christi processions are continuing right up to this very day. But now uh, the railway, of course, uh, I think the last train uh, ran in September 1937. So it has not been an actual railway line since then, but we make great use of it. Here we have it used as uh, uh, an art installation by Catalonian artist Chevy Bayona. It is also uh, the venue for our annual street party in Newport, which we look forward to every year and hopefully will again very soon in post COVID times. But mainly it's used every day by visitors and locals alike just to walk across, to traverse the town from one side of the Black Oak River to the other and to take in the stunning views from the viaduct. So that's a little bit about the viaduct. 
The next little piece of our built heritage that I wanted to talk about was St. Patrick's Church. And that dominates the skyline also um, from its perch on top of the hill there at Barrack Hill. It's a very beautiful uh, building. Finished in 1918. Uh, so it's just over 100 years old, but actually the local parishioners were paying for it uh, for quite a few years after that, as you'll see from this postcard um, where it says, this is to certify that Mr. Peter David has paid 10 pounds, the full cess levied on him for the new church uh, in 1925. And as you can imagine, 10 pounds in that time was quite a significant amount of money. Uh, so it was a huge investment for the town and for Canon Michael MacDonald, the parish priest at the time. Some people say that the real treasure of Newport Church lies within, and that is this absolutely stunning uh, stained glass window designed uh, and made by Harry, Harry Clark. And um, this was actually his final work. This is Harry here. His absolute final work. And uh, it is called The Last Judgment. And it's a really, really stunning piece of work. If you're ever in Newport, I recommend you go to visit it, but also that you go visit it early in the morning. That's when you get the best view because it is on the Eastern chancel uh, wall and uh, the rising sun just shines through it just early in the morning and it's quite a stunning sight. So it's the last judgment and you can see there in the first window you have Mary and some of the saints and also the saintly making their way up to heaven. In the middle window there you have God standing in judgment on all our souls uh, along with some of his apostles and I think some of the angels. But not everybody's having a great day because in the third window, and this is the window that Harry himself actually completed, um, we have, uh, well, the soul of the damned being cast down to hell. And that is a, quite a stunning piece, that, that, that window in and of itself. I'll show you some detail there. You can see some quite frightening looking characters. And Harry was in the habit of putting his own self-portrait into some of his work. And that's the one I've circled there. I don't know if you agree, but I'll turn it around there. And you can judge for yourself whether you think it looks a little like its designer. And that is uh, St. Patrick's Church. It really is quite stunning. Now I'm going to move on a little bit. That's just a little bit about the built heritage of the town. I want to talk briefly about the lighting because um, uh, like most towns in the world, in the developed world and most towns in Ireland, um, we really are only now starting to appreciate the impact that bad lighting has on our health, on our well-being, on our wildlife, on our biodiversity. And Newport is, is uh, no different from any other town. So there are some challenges here with, the, with some parts of the town being badly lit or overlit. As you can see there, the, the church at night, uh, not looking its best, but I'm absolutely delighted to say that we really are doing something to try to, to fix that. And in November, we launched the Newport Lighting Master Plan which will address some of these lighting issues. And we hope to be, and are confident to be, the first dark sky friendly town in Ireland. And you'll see some of the conceptual pictures here. Um, and the theme of this is really about letting the lights shine down from heaven, rather than us shining a light up into the sky, we let the heavens shine, shine down on us. So you, as you can see, the plan is to have much more subtle lighting of our iconic buildings, such as the church and the viaduct there. And not just those iconic buildings, but also our streets. In fact, that work has already started and the streets, the public street lighting on the main street in Newport is now 2,700 Kelvin. Uh, public lighting, and that's a really great uh, progress for us. 
So we look forward to the day when Newport will be the first dark sky friendly town in Ireland and that you'll be able to view the stars from the town itself. But in the meantime, we have wonderful stargazing sites very close to the town. For instance, there you have Letterkeen Bothy up in Wild Nathan itself in the Mayo Dark Sky Park. That is probably, and I don't think I'll be corrected on this, but it's probably one of the darkest places in the entire island of Ireland. And that's that beautiful photograph there by Brian Wilson showing it at night. Another great place to view the stars is at Rockfleet Castle or Carrickahowley Castle, the erstwhile home of Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen. Uh, that was her home um, for many years. In fact, she died there um, and at night. A stunning picture of the Milky Way with Rockfield Castle there in the foreground. And my own personal favourite is Burrishul Abbey. And that's Burrishul Abbey right in, on its uh, sheltered site there on Clue Bay. Stunning in the daytime, in the evening, but more particularly at night, as you can see from Steve Hanley's photo there. Even though you do get a little bit of sky glow from Westport across the bay, just a little, you might see it there. Uh, it really is a great place for stargazing because it's only three kilometers from the town of Newport. It's, it's actually quite an easy walk along the Great Western Greenway and a slight detour off it. And it is this very uh, convenience of it and the great lighting and the lovely setting that means that it has become almost a second home for a Newport Astronomy Club, who are there doing some stargazing pre-COVID times, of course, as you can imagine. Uh, but it makes for a great spot for, for stargazing, a great safe place to go stargazing, very close to the town of Newport. So I actually think that's a great place for me to stop. I hope I haven't taken up too much of your time, but when I'm focusing there on Newport Astronomy Club, it strikes me that it is the perfect place to stop. Thank you for your attention and welcome the founder of Newport Astronomy Club uh, to talk to you uh, about exploring Mars. So I'm going to hand over to Derek now. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear. Make sure that we're settled. Okay, folks, let's um, go and explore Mars. Um, it was in the news a little bit ago when the Perseverance rover successfully landed there, but it was in the news again two weeks ago when a team from Trinity College in Dublin unraveled one of the mysteries of these spider forms that were spotted on the Martian surface. Um, we didn't really know what caused them or what they were, but using a Mars atmosphere simulation chamber in London, they were able to successfully show that these patterns are actually caused by dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide going straight to a gas. My own interest in the planet predates this by quite some considerable period. Back in the 60s, I was lucky enough to get out to Dunsink Observatory on one of their open evenings and gaze through this spectacular old telescope. Um, and what I saw when I got to the eyepiece was this, a, an appreciable disc and some genuine surface features, and you've got to take this in the context of the absolutely dreadful plastic telescopes that were all we could get our hands on back in those days. So Mars, it's a small, small planet, very little atmosphere, almost no magnetic field, low gravity, but for a small planet, it has some quite amazing features. There is compelling evidence that liquid water flowed on the surface in the past which begs the question, did life evolve there then? And could it still be there today? Or will we even be able to find traces of it? Likewise, again, for such a small planet, it has some absolutely gorgeous features. This is Olympus Mons. It's the largest 
extinct volcano in the solar system. And you can get an idea of the absolute scale of it here. You can see it's practically as big as France and considerably taller than anything on Earth. And what a tourist destination that would turn out to be. The other huge feature on Mars is the Valles Marineris, which is a valley stretching across practically a quarter of the surface of Mars. Uh, again, a huge feature. You can see it here in false color. And here, just to give you a concept of the scale, I've put the Grand Canyon down the bottom for, uh, for reference, so dwarfed. And Mars has two little moons, once thought to be captured asteroids, but now more widely believed to be actual true moons, so formed from debris in the Martian orbit as the planet itself formed. And you can see that Phobos orbits very, very close to, to Mars and is consequently being stressed by tide forces. You can even see some of the possible cracking on the surface there in that image. And Phobos is almost certainly doomed in that the Martian gravity is very likely to tear it apart in the immediate future astronomically speaking, so possibly in the next 50 million years or so. Another thing that Mars does, which perplexed some of our forebears, was it does this little rinky dink in its orbit as we look at it. Um, certainly annoyed the ancient Greeks quite a bit because they loved the idea of perfect uniform circular orbits. You can see it here in this photographic image. We know today that it's just an artifact of us viewing it and doing a bit of a legal overtaking really on the inside. So we actually, it's only a, a visual thing, but nevertheless, it does explain the retrograde motion that we seem to see. And as soon as telescopes got good enough, astronomers started putting on paper the maps of what they thought they were seeing. You can see in the upper half of that image what appeared to be channels of some description, and that's what Schiaparelli called them. He called them canali, which means channels, not canals. Um, an American businessman by the name of Percival Lowell took him up slightly wrongly, and he thought that actually they were canals and that a Martian civilization was trying to channel water down from the poles. Um, and he built this observatory in Arizona to go looking for this Martian civilization. When he had no look at that, he then went looking for a planet out beyond the orbit of Mercury. And he didn't have any look there either. But this is the observatory where Pluto would eventually be discovered. So the idea that Mars has life and had canals, this, this was a common thought in, in our consciousness. All of the great authors have written books set on Mars, going there, living there, colonizing it, even terraforming it. I happened to be just browsing through one of those as I was putting this talk together. And this is one of the greats, Larry Niven, in his book, Protector. He's not very complimentary about Mars in it. I'll let you read that for yourself. But you've got to take this in the context that it is from the point of view of a person living in a civilization on the asteroid belt. So I guess we will forgive him his slightly negative. And equally, of course, Mars is featured in the movies. Lots of fine and not so fine movies there. Back in 1938, Orson Welles did a radio play of H.G. Wells, The War of the Worlds. It's widely supposed that he caused an absolute pandemonium and panic. It would appear in reality that there weren't actually that many people listening, but people did flee from their homes in panic at the thought that the Martians were invading. And, you know, it's, it's down to the fact that people believed that there was a Martian civilization and that they might actually have cast envious eyes upon our resources if their own planet was beginning to run short. And then, of course, Mars did attack. And some of the great in Hollywood were zapped in the course of that movie. 
And Hollywood went on then to strand an astronaut on the surface and tell his story. So that's Mars in popular culture, if you like. Um, there have been a huge number of missions there, and I'm not going to go through them all. I'm just going to briefly touch on some of the notable firsts. So the first time that we went there was in Mariner 4. It flew by Mars in 1965, and it took these pictures. So the cameras at the time weren't quite as good as the ones we have today, but you can see on the rightmost image that there is visible cratering. And this was perhaps one of the first inklings that we got that the surface of Mars maybe resembled the surface of our moon more than that of a habitable planet. First flyby, and then we have the first landing. This is Mars 3 from the Soviet Union. It failed almost immediately upon landing. It never sent back any useful information. First successful landing in 1976 was Viking 1. And it sent back these pictures. And again, you're starting to see that the surface is dry, possibly arid, rocky, and again, no canals, no Martians. First successful rover on the surface was the Mars Pathfinder Sojourner mission. You might recognize the, uh, the vehicles from the Martian film if you've seen it. Successfully landed the rover and took this amazing picture of the, uh, the sunset from the Martian surface. The ESA came a little late to the scene with Mars Express in 2003. And it had a lander on board as well, a project called the Beagle, the Beagle 2. It landed on the surface, but never phoned home. Um, you can see bottom left what it was supposed to look like on the surface. It was supposed to open up its solar panels and its communications. And it looks as if either this failed or it tangled in the landing bag. So yet again, Mars swallowed up a lander. And this is quite a a common theme in the, uh, the history of trying to land vehicles there. And then NASA sent Spirit an opportunity there to very iconic rovers, solar powered, vastly outliving their planned design life and sending back amazing data and images and very nearly getting a flat tire on a planet where there are no repair stations. You can see the rock, sharp rocky surface has caused considerable damage to the rover wheel there. And then earlier this year, of course, Perseverance, Mars 2020, landed successfully. And one of the more interesting things about Perseverance is that it is going to use these sample tubes. So there's a core drill on board. It's going to drill rock samples and it's going to stash those in those sample tube holders up at the top of the image there. There are 43 of these all together. And hopefully, at some point in the future, we would be able to collect these and bring them back here for complete analysis. So Perseverance landed at Jezero Crater and it looks very much like in the past, this would have been a lagoon-like structure and very similar structures here on Earth have hosted early life. So these are stromatolites off the Australian coast and among other things, um, they leave very distinct uh, fossil remnants. So again, if we can get core samples of these and get them back, it would possibly tell us whether or not life evolved on Mars at some point in its earlier history. The other amazing thing about the uh, Perseverance rover project is that it actually has a prototype helicopter on board. So this is Ingenuity. It's a proof of concept as much as anything else, but obviously allows access to areas where the rover itself can safely go and a proof that, you know, it is possible to make a helicopter or a quadcopter fly in this amazingly thin atmosphere with um, implications for missions to, to other planets and moons. So let's look at the Martian surface. You can see the rover tracks there. Because the Martian atmosphere is so thin, lots and lots of rock from space successfully get down through it and land on the surface. So it's constantly being bombarded. The surface is being pulverized. That's an image of a brand new crater down bottom right. So the surface contains this 
pulverized dust, which is incredibly fine, much finer than, for example, talcum powder. And even though the atmosphere is very thin, it's very easy to stir this dust up. You can see this image from the Curiosity rover of an actual dust devil. But as the atmosphere heats in the Martian summers, you get quite significant dust storms lasting many months. You can see the difference between two separate years here and this rather spectacular image of the dust progressing across the surface of the planet. It's not great from the point of view of blocking sunlight and clogging up your solar panels. So if that's the way you intend to power your mission and it's still doomed for both spirit and opportunity, unfortunately, you can see that these dust storms lasting months are very bad news. And it was used also as a plot device in the Martian where it was threatening to blow over their spacecraft. Well, given that the Martian atmosphere is only about 1% as dense as our own, it's probably not going to knock over spacecraft, but they had to find a way to strand the poor guy there. So we have to forgive him that. And you can see the Martian atmosphere at the top of that image. It's very, very faint and thin, but it goes a long way up. And it is a major challenge when it comes to landing on the Martian surface. The other thing that our stranded Martian did was he grew potatoes by carting surface material in from, from Mars into his habitat. And I'm not going to discuss what he used as fertilizer, but he managed to keep himself alive by growing potatoes, basically. And there's a major snag with this because all analysis of the Martian surface indicates that there are perchlorates in it. And while they are possibly a resource in that they contain oxygen, they are also quite toxic. They attack the human thyroid gland. So there's a major problem with, for example, plants picking these up and then them getting into the, uh, the human diet where they would be toxic. Um, but potatoes are of great interest I and mean, they have been grown successfully in Mars-like conditions. And obviously the idea that you could send a robotic greenhouse or a robotic farm on ahead of you and have crops and plants waiting for you when you landed on the surface. I and mean, it's very, very attractive. And the first astronauts to visit Mars obviously are going to be vegans. So, <laughs> so I mentioned that Mars is extraordinarily difficult to land on. When we bring a mission back into the Earth's atmosphere, we use a blunt vehicle with a heat shield and we use the atmosphere to slow it down. When we were landing on Mars in the sixth, on the moon rather, in the 60s and 70s, there was no atmosphere at all, so we could land on rockets. Mars with a thin, high atmosphere is the worst of both worlds in that there's not enough atmosphere to really help you with parachutes and the like, and yet you encounter it quite soon after you get close to Mars and you're traveling at interplanetary velocities so at several kilometers per second, and this is speed that you have to lose. So in the early days, so Pathfinder, for example, Spirit and Opportunity, they use landing bags, but there's a limit to the amount of weight you can put in those. And also there is the real risk that the fabric when it deflates will tangle in your vehicle and trap it. It's one of the possible explanations why Beagle 2 didn't get going. Um, to land really serious payloads like Curiosity and Perseverance, you actually need a sky crane. And I'll get onto that in a sec, but the actual whole process of your vastly expensive mission, arriving at Mars and then getting down to the surface has become known as the seven minutes of terror. And there's some great video on this. I suggest if you haven't seen it, go out and have a look. So back in 2016, just before the very first Dark Sky Festival here, the ESA sent ExoMars there. It was a two-part mission. So the trace gas orbiter was going to stay in orbit and monitor methane, whereas the Schiaparelli landing was another concept vehicle to test the landing system. And it also, due to a momentary lapse in monitoring its telemetry, it also failed. So Mars swallows up yet another vehicle. And you can see that in this time-lapse. So it crashed at something over 100 kilometers an hour and dug a little hole for itself. 
But the Trace Gas Orbiter mission is in orbit and it is monitoring methane releases in the upper Martian atmosphere, which may indicate possibly life there. Although like a lot of these biosignature gases, they can also be produced by purely chemical processes. So you can see in the soil there, maybe there's microbes producing methane, but there are purely chemical pathways as well. So this is the landing bag system that Pathfinder used to touch down on the surface. So just bounced till it came to a soft landing and then deflated. Um, lately, we've been using a much more high-tech approach. This is Adam Stelzner who designed it, demonstrating it. And you can see that he's looking a little bit stressed in the image to the right, because that's during the actual descent of Curiosity to the Martian surface. So a lot was depending on the successful outcome of his design. So I think he's perfectly entitled to look a little on the worried side. And that's how the scupper crane works during its final moments. It touches the orbit, the, the lander, the payload down onto the surface and cuts the cable and flies away. So no tangling, no parachute cords to get caught up in. Once it works, it seems to work reasonably safely. Certainly Curiosity and Perseverance got there all in one piece. Slightly less successful was the Mars Climate Orbiter due to get to Mars in 1999. It was specified and designed to accept its inputs in metric measurements. And yet when they tried to put it into orbit, they sent it instructions in Imperial. So uh, that was the end of that. That's an easy way to burn up 300 odd million. Um, I want to finish by just talking a little bit about what our prospects of going to Mars in, per in person might be. All of the space agencies have plans and ideas and concepts of what an actual landing on the surface might look like. So Mars orbits the sun every two years and we orbit every one. So once every two and a tiny bit years, we both line up on the same side of the sun. It's called the synodic period. And it more or less determines when we can travel to Mars in a spacecraft economically, though maybe economically is not a good word to use in this context. You can see it here, the minimum energy transfer orbit, the Holman transfer. It is possible to go to Mars at other times, but it will use more fuel or for the same amount of fuel, push less mass. So we've been talking and planning on this since 1938. That's Werner von Braun, the architect of the rockets that launched the Apollo program. He wrote the Mars project in 38, published in English in I think 1940. And his idea all along was that the moon landings were just a first step that from the moon landings, we would take what we knew about that and the technology that we developed and we would go on to Mars in the 1970s. And that never happened. And he died quite a disappointed man in the 70s because of that. And it might be just as well we didn't make that jump at that time because quite likely we didn't quite know enough about what we were biting off. There's a huge challenge in sending humans to Mars in that once you leave our planet, you also leave the protection of its magnetic field. And once you leave that, you are completely exposed to solar and cosmic radiation. So the challenge here, as you can see, the 100 millisievert mark up here, I don't know if you can see the cursor there, this is about a lifetime dose of radiation. So if you have received 100 millisieverts of radiation in your life, no more space travel, no more chest x-rays. And you can see that the trip to Mars exceeds the recommended lifetime dose and any long exposure on Mars equally exceeds the, the recommended dose. So the radiation challenge in terms of getting people safely to Mars and back is huge. And shielding unfortunately equals mass. So it is a huge challenge. The other huge medical issue with prolonged weightlessness is that 
several male astronauts who have been on long duration missions to the ISS have suffered permanent eye damage. So it hasn't happened to any of the female astronauts, but you've got to keep in mind that there have been vastly more male than female astronauts up there, but it may be gender related. So again, a long duration weightless trip to Mars may mean that the, the astronauts have suffered eye damage as well as radiation damage. So yeah, the trip to Mars, it's hazardous. Um, you've got hazards to the vehicle itself, mechanical failures or possible meteors, bright strikes, for example. I'm still hoping we're going to get there. NASA are talking about the 2030s. Roscosmos are talking maybe the 2040s. I think we've got a poll going, asking what you think about that, maybe not. For myself, I was lucky enough back in 1969 to be allowed to stay up to see Neil Armstrong's One Small Step. And I'm hoping very much to be allowed to stay up to see the first human footfall on Mars as well. I have a little bit of footage, it's not the seven minutes of terror, to show you to finish with. Um, it's a tribute to possibly a slightly undersung mission that is nevertheless critical. But in the meantime, I would like to take your questions and I'll show you the video then. Thank you, Derek. That was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we do have a poll. Actually, if Georgia is there in the background, I will ask her to. Uh, yeah. I will ask her to launch that poll. I will. And it will be asking you yeah, when you think that we might land a mission on Mars. And there, it's just appearing now. When do you think we might land a mission on Mars? This decade, 2030 to 2035, 35 to 40, even later than that, or never. And I think you can see the answers are, are coming <laughs> in thick and fast. Well, fair play, folks. Yes. We let that run for, for yes. a few minutes. And uh, the second question in that poll is, do you think we will find life there when we get there? Or indeed, life would include uh, evidence of past life, which is possibly more likely. But let's see what you're saying on that. 59% so far are saying yes that we will find evidence of life on Mars when we get there. And most people seem to think that we will land on Mars between 2035 and 2040, 43% of you. So do you guys know something that we don't know? <laughs> That's fascinating. I hope one of you gets to go. <laughs> very, very interesting. Uh, so don't forget to put your your questions into uh, into the Q&A box. People seem to be enjoying the talk, Derek. Thank you. Um, uh, Stephen McVeigh is asking, is Ingenuity flying next week? Yes, probably. Okay. Any more detail on that? I, I'm just a civilian. In the <laughs> I'm, I'm watching exactly the same thing as everybody else is watching. Right. What do you think so? Yeah. Uh, Donald Riley is asking, uh, can you talk about the Mars oxygen experiment that the new rover is going to do? Um, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put my hand up and say, sorry, you have me there. I've been following this since it was at the planning stages, but I am. Um, no, I don't really know much about that. Okay, I guess the answer there is Google that one, Donald. <laughs> uh, or maybe you know yourself, but thank I you will. for the question. Uh, if we go to Mars, uh, will we be able to get back? Or is it a one-way trip <laughs> is a question. There have been a number of missions proposed that would be one way. Um, there was Mars One and several others, and they actually had people sign up for them. Um, the idea being that you would go and you would be resupplied from Earth, but that you would not have the uh, ability to actually fly back home again. Mm. Um, it takes a lot of the engineering out of it in that more than half the problem is getting you safely home again. Um, obviously, if you're on Mars for keeps, then, you know, if you have a medical emergency, <laughs> you're, you're in big trouble. 
Mm. If some of your supply missions fail or fail to land successfully or in the wrong place, again, you're going to be in big trouble. So they've been proposed. They had people signing up for them. Um, none of them ever went beyond the planning stages, beyond the, the point where people were actually asked to put their name down for them. And of course, there's ethical issues in, in terms of flying people to a place where they can't get back home from. Mm -hmm. But they certainly have been proposed and certainly people were interested in them. Okay, very interesting. Um, uh, Karen is asking, would you go to Mars if offered the opportunity? And what do you think about that? <laughs> I would love to go to space or the moon or Mars, but you know, not one of us is an island. It's not really right just to up sticks and go to Mars. I probably wouldn't survive the trip. So it would be quite a commitment I'd be making. And um, I'm looking at the faces you're right. <laughs> no, no, you're not going. <laughs> Uh, what is the maximum period that astronauts could remain on the surface of Mars is a question from Andrew McGrady. Well, the hope would be that we would find caves or lava tubes, something to get us off the surface and away from the bulk of the radiation hazard. So, you know, once you're out of the radiation on the surface, you're limited by your supplies. Um, so one of the proposals would be that you would use the low energy transfer to get to Mars and then wait for that window to come around again. So you would be on the surface for maybe two years or something like that. Um, if you don't successfully find a somewhere to shield yourself from the radiation on the surface, then you've got real problems. So. It's, it's all about the environment, you know, extracting sufficient atmosphere from the soil or from the atmosphere that's there and also shielding yourself from the cosmic radiation because unfortunately as a small planet mars has cooled and its internal dynamo has wound down so it doesn't have the kind of magnetic field that we have here shielding ourselves mm -hmm. okay uh carol loftus in mulrani hi there carol how long do you think it would take for a manned mission to get to mars using the technology available today you're talking at least months. Months. Yeah, that's with what we have now. So you will be in space in weightless conditions for at least some months, depending on how much fuel you, you care to burn, the speed at which you want to go there. So you are talking about, you know, exercise machinery, which is heavy. You're talking about exercise regimen, diet, the whole bit. And even then you can fall prey to this eye damage syndrome we, as yet. There may be a genetic factor in it. Mm. Um, it may be possible to identify the more vulnerable to it, you know, as time goes by and as more experiments are done on the ISS. But certainly there's no point in getting to Mars if, you know, your eyes are so damaged you can't do useful work. Mm. Okay. And, and Charles Smith is saying, can we say that the Perseverance mission has brought science to a new level? Yes. I think we can. We've been building on the successful rover missions of the past and successful landings. The idea of a sample return mission is new. Um, NASA have, I think at the last count, something like 70, 76, 78, what they would consider burning questions about Mars. And a sample return mission and perseverance is the first step in that would answer about 38 of them. So getting Martian samples off Mars and back here to where you know the full gamut of scientific research can be let loose at them uh, is huge, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, a question just come in there from Jim. I think you might've covered it in one of your early slides, but um, it, it bears repeating. How does the gravity on Mars compare to Earth? It's 38%. 38%, okay. So, yeah, Mars is about half the diameter and a little less than half the gravity. So there is gravity, but yeah, it is about half, less than half. Mm. Uh, and what could the possible positive impact of Mars exploration for us back on Earth be? Like what kind of technical breakthroughs do you think there might be? That's a good one. Yeah, if you look at the moon landings, I mean, there were considerable advances in technology and science and materials 
all across the span of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, there will have to be technological advances to carry out a successful manned mission there. And who knows what those advances might be in medicine, science, engineering. Mm. Um, the other big one is whether or not we might find signs of life there. Because right now, the only place we know that life exists is here. So we're working blindly from a sample of one. Mm. We think that single cell life should be pretty much everywhere and more complex, complex life will be more rare. But if we can find evidence of life on Mars that is even marginally different from what we know is here, then it means that at least simple life is everywhere out there. And that's yeah. going to be a game changer in how we look out there and possibly in terms of missions to Europa or Enceladus or other places where we think we might find life. Mm. So it might, you know, it probably will spur on missions further out into the solar system to also go and look for life. But there is bound to be engineering and materials benefits as well. Okay, yeah, I agree. Now, Tom Finnegan is saying, is everyone getting too focused on Mars as a solar system life possibility when there are other and possibly better possibilities like Europa, Titan? etc. Well, each of those destinations has missions in the planning stage as well. They are considerably more difficult to get to. Um, but there is the Europa Clif Clipper mission, which is planned for, I think, 2026 or 2027. Mm -hmm. um, the Ingenuity helicopter will feed into the Titan Dragonfly mission, which is also on in NASA's planning. And we are all hoping that we'll go back to Enceladus at some stage. And you mustn't forget, too, that there's been biosignature gases found in the clouds of Venus. So that's now becoming maybe a more interesting destination, too. Okay. So I think it's all of a piece. You know, we are hopefully going to find life somewhere. It mightn't be on Mars, but the techniques we are going to be using there are probably applicable pretty much everywhere. Mm. But it, it's not just all of the eggs going in the Martian basket. There are other missions to other places where we think there might be life. Okay, Mary Kermidgen is asking, have there been any missions to Mars moons? I don't think we've landed on them, but some of the missions that have gone to Mars certainly have taken imagery and have done radar scans. So we know, for example, that Phobos appears to be made up of rock and gravel under a thin skin and that feeds into the theory that it's going to be broken apart by Martian gravity in the short term and form a ring system. Um, one of the proposals going right back to Werner von Braun's time is that we would use the, uh, the Martian moons as staging posts and possibly mine them for refueling. So it has been talked about, um, studies have been done in terms of landing on them, but I don't believe we have landed on them. Okay, uh, and Mary's son, uh, Zadik. Hi there, Zadik, long time no see. Zadik is asking, how, have there been any signs of life on Mars moons? No, no, no they're too small, but completely, ah. there's no atmosphere at all on them. Um, no, we haven't seen any traces of life there. All right. Uh, Finian Bradwell is asking how much research has been done into the removal of toxic uh, elements from the soil on Mars, um, Tox toxic chemicals from Martian soil. Yeah, the, the, the thing with the perchlorates is that they are water soluble. Mm. So it is relatively simple to, um, to wash them out of what's there. Or if you can somehow sequester them, then you can split the oxygen out of them and you'd be left trying to get rid of the chlorine. So in either case, you can do things with perchlorates. The, um, the problem with trying to wash them out of the soil is that while there is water on Mars, it's not readily available, mm -hmm. it's frozen. The other thing about the surface of Mars is the dust itself, because it's so fine, is going to damage human lungs. You know, it's going to stick to your spacesuit. It's going to be very difficult to get off your spacesuit as you're going in through airlocks, for example, and then it's going to be in the air. So, you know, the, the um, Apollo astronauts reported that when they came in from the lunar surface, there was this gunpowder smell in the air, which was moon dust. And that has been shown to be extremely carcinogenic. So yeah, there are health hazards <laughs> involved in this in a big way. Yeah. But, yeah, great question, thanks. Yeah, very, very good. 
Um, gosh, lots of questions there, and we may not get to all of them, uh, and I do apologize for that. Um, what we might try to do is, as the final video is running, we might look through them and try to answer them uh, in the Q&A box itself. Um, uh, but one that has just has come up is from Jim Kiernan, and he said, you've mentioned health hazards, health hazards of space travel, but he is wondering if there are any proven health benefits. Am I right that you get taller? Is that, is that one possible health benefit, Derek? Well, we're certainly not evolved for low gravity or weightlessness. And, you know, we suffer from calcium deficiencies. We suffer from all sorts of, yeah, unforeseen side effects from being weightless. And if you've got a weak heart, for example, mm. you're going to do much better in a low gravity environment because you're heart won't have to work so hard to pump blood around your system. And the other um, big advantage to weightlessness is we can make chemicals there that we can't make on the surface. So there are actual medicines being made in weightlessness that can't be fabricated here in gravity. But we are not at all evolved to live in a weightless environment. And it does, I think, do us much more harm than good. I mean, the astronauts have to act exercise pretty much non-stop when they're not working mm. um, they have all reported that they get great night's sleep you know they have these little cocoon sleeping bags and they said they never slept so well as when they were weightless so that that i like the sound of that <laughs> um, but in principle you know we are evolved to live under gra gravity and um yeah we, we we don't tend to do so well out of it I mean, you can read Scott Kelly's book. They sent Scott Kelly up to the ISS for a year because he had a twin brother, so a genetic twin ah. that was left behind here. So it was it was a nice mission in that after a year in space, they could compare him to the brother that hadn't been in space for a year. And he struggled for a long time to get his fitness and his health and everything back. And that, that was just 12 months up there. So... Uh, in principle, it's not that good for you. Okay, great question, though. Fine um, question. I have to say, great answer. Okay, Donald asks the rover wheel that was damaged. What was that wheel made of? It's made from some compass, you know, an advanced material. They never figured that a couple of sharp rocks on Mars was ever mm. going to be enough to damage it. So they make it out of even stronger stuff now. Yeah, obviously. right. Um, it was never anticipated that the rocks on Mars would be strong enough to take lumps out of it. And obviously, if you get a flat tire on Mars, it's not good news. But yeah, some, I, I'm going to have to Google that. Great question. I, I don't actually know what the material is. Okay, yeah. Uh, brilliant, Eric. Thank you so much. Lots and lots of questions coming in. And I just think in the interests of, of time and in... Uh, finishing on time that we may just leave the Q&A session at that but we will try to look through them before the actual webinar finishes and get to as many of them as we can um, but in the meantime I think you had a little yes. video footage that you wanted to finish with just to finish um... Sorry, we're just going to put the... Uh... Hi, everyone. We're just going to share our screen again. There we go. So, folks, thanks for all the questions. Brilliant. Um, I'm sorry for not being able to answer them all, but I'm very curious to find out the ones that I didn't manage to answer. Um, just to finish, I'm going to play a little, little video clip. Um, nice guy. So Mars is actually in the sky at the minute. It's out in the winter constellations. So it's up there in Taurus, up near Orion. So make the most of it um, and make the most of the winter constellations too. They are setting now as we head into the spring. The video clip that I'm going to show you is footage from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has been there since 2006 and has again, like a lot of NASA projects, long outlived its planned designed life and is now a vital link in communications back from Mars to Earth. And the video clip is just going to feature some of the image that this amazing piece of engineering has taken. So I hope you enjoyed this and thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Derek.
Amazing footage. Thank you, yes, Derek. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank okay. you so much, Fiona and Derek. Um, that was absolutely wonderful and a great start to the week. And um, just looking forward to the, to the rest of it. Thank you so much. And just folks, thanks for joining us again from all over the world. We've posted up on Facebook um, where our um, visitors are from. And um, it's quite impressive, actually. So have a, have a look if you get a chance. Um, and tomorrow evening, if we can draw your attention to um, our, um, our website for what's on tomorrow, we join Clare Island. Uh, so it's the first time we moved to Clare Island as a host community. We're delighted that they're um, hosting a dark sky event. And uh, we have a local um, astrophotography. We'll hear from the local school in Clare Island on some work they've been doing. And then we will introduce an art collective from the UK called Lumen, who will present some of their works in astrophotography and uh, astronomy and working to um, reduce light pollution. So on that note, um, thank you once again, Fiona and Derek, uh, for a terrific evening. And um, folks, we look forward to seeing you later in the week. And please share our website if you can. It's in the chat box. Um, mayo.skypark.ie and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you again. Thanks very much everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>